Section 20 of Coningsby or the New Generation by Benjamin Disraeli. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Book 5, Chapter 3. We must now revert to the family, or rather the household, of Lord Monmouth, in which considerable changes and events had occurred since the visit of Coningsby to the castle in the preceding autumn. In the first place, the earliest frost of the winter had carried off the aged proprietor of Hellingsley, that contiguous estate which Lord Monmouth so much coveted, the possession of which was indeed one of the few objects of his life, and to secure which he was prepared to pay far beyond its intrinsic value, great as that undoubtedly was. Yet Lord Monmouth did not become its possessor. Long as his mind had been intent upon the subject, skilful as had been his combinations to secure his prey and unlimited the means which were to achieve his purpose another stepped in and without his privity without even the consolation of a struggle stole away the prize and this too a man whom he hated almost the only individual out of his own family that he did hate a man who had crossed him before in similar enterprises who was his avowed foe had lavished treasure to oppose him in elections, raised associations against his interests, established journals to assail him, denounced him in public, agitated against him in private, had declared more than once that he would make the country too hot for him, his personal, inveterate, indomitable foe, Mr. Millbank of Millbank. The loss of Hellingsley was a bitter disappointment to Lord Monmouth, but the loss of it to such an adversary touched him to the quick. He did not seek to control his anger. He could not succeed even in concealing his agitation. He threw upon Rigby that glance so rare with him, but under which men always quailed, that play of the eye which Lord Monmouth shared in common with Henry the Eighth, that struck awe into the trembling commons when they had given an obnoxious vote as the king entered the gallery of his palace, and looked around him. It was the look which implied that dreadful question. Why have I bought you that such things should happen? Why have I unlimited means and unscrupulous agents? It made Rigby even feel, even his brazen tones were hushed. To fly from everything disagreeable was the practical philosophy of Lord Monmouth, but he was as brave as he was sensual. He would not shrink before the new proprietor of Hellingsley, he therefore remained at the castle with an aching heart, and redoubled his hospitalities. An ordinary mind might have been soothed by the unceasing consideration and the skilful and delicate flattery that ever surrounded Lord Monmouth. But his sagacious intelligence was never for a moment the dupe of his vanity. He had no self-love, and as he valued no one, there were really no feelings to play upon. He saw through everybody and everything and when he had detected their purpose, discovered their weakness or their vileness, he calculated whether they could contribute to his pleasure or his convenience in a degree that counterbalanced the objections which might be urged against their intentions, or their less pleasing and profitable qualities. To be pleased was always a principal object with Lord Monmouth, but when a man wants vengeance, gay amusement is not exactly a satisfactory substitute. A month elapsed. Lord Monmouth, with a serene or smiling visage to his guests, but in private, taciturn and morose, scarcely ever gave a word to Mr. Rigby, but continually bestowed on him glances which painfully affected the appetite of that gentleman. In a hundred ways it was intimated to Mr. Rigby that he was not a welcome guest, and yet something was continually given to him to do which rendered it impossible for him to take his departure. In this state of affairs, another event occurred which changed the current of feeling, and by its possible consequences distracted the Marquis from his brooding meditations over his discomfiture in the matter of Hellingsley. The Prince Colonna, who, since the steeplechase, had imbibed a morbid predilection for such amusements, and indeed for every species of rough riding, was thrown from his horse and killed on the spot. This calamity broke up the party at Coningsby, which was not at the moment very numerous. 
Mr. Rigby, by command, instantly seized the opportunity of preventing the arrival of other guests who were expected. This catastrophe was the cause of Mr. Rigby resuming in a great measure his old position in the castle. There were a great many things to be done, and all disagreeable. He achieved them all, and studied everybody's convenience. Coroner's inquests, funerals especially, weeping women, these were all spectacles which Lord Monmouth could not endure, but he was so high-bred that he would not for the world that there should be in manner or degree the slightest deficiency in propriety or even sympathy. Mr. Rigby did it all, gave evidence at the inquest, was chief mourner at the funeral, and arranged everything so well that not a single emblem of death crossed the sight of Lord Monmouth while Madame Colonna found submission in his exhortations, and the Princess Lucretia, a little more pale and pensive than usual, listened with tranquillity to his discourse on the vanity of all sublunary things. When the tumult had subsided, and habits and feelings had fallen into their old routine, and relapsed into their ancient channels, the Marquis proposed that they should all return to London, and with great formality, though with warmth, begged that Madame Colonna would ever consider his roof as her own. All were glad to quit the castle, which now presented a scene so different from its former animation, and Madame Colonna, weeping, accepted the hospitality of her friend until the impending expansion of the spring would permit her to return to Italy. This notice of return to her own country seemed to occasion the Marquis great disquietude. After they had remained about a month in London, Madame Colonna sent for Mr. Rigby one morning to tell him how very painful it was to her feelings to remain under the roof of Monmouth House without the sanction of a husband, that the circumstance of being a foreigner, under such unusual affliction, might have excused, though not authorized, the step at first, and for a moment, but that the continuance of such a course was quite out of the question that she owed it to herself, to her stepchild, no longer to trespass on this friendly hospitality, which, if persisted in, might be liable to misconstruction. Mr. Rigby listened with great attention to this statement, and never in the least interrupted Madame Colonna, and then offered to do that which he was convinced the lady desired, namely to make the Marquis acquainted with the painful state of her feelings. This he did according to his fashion, and with sufficient dexterity. Mr. Rigby himself was anxious to know which way the wind blew, and the mission with which he had been entrusted fell in precisely with his inclinations and necessities. The Marquis listened to the communication and sighed, then turned gently round and surveyed himself in the mirror, and sighed again, then said to Rigby, "'You understand exactly what I mean, Rigby,' It is quite ridiculous their going, and infinitely distressing to me. They must stay. Rigby repaired to the princess, full of mysterious bustle, and with a face beaming with importance and satisfaction. He made much of the two sighs, fully justified the confidence of the Marquis in his comprehension of unexplained intentions, prevailed on Madame Colonna to have some regard for the feelings of one so devoted, expatiated on the insignificance of worldly misconstructions when replied to by such honourable intentions, and fully succeeded in his mission. They did stay. Month after month rolled on, and still they stayed, every month all the family becoming more resigned or more content and more cheerful. As for the Marquis himself, Mr. Rigby never remembered him more serene and even joyous, his lordship scarcely ever entered general society. The Colonna family remained in strict seclusion, and he preferred the company of these accomplished and congenial friends to the mob of the great world. Between Madame Colonna and Mr. Rigby there had always subsisted considerable confidence. Now that gentleman seemed to have achieved fresh and greater claims to her regard. In the pleasure with which he looked forward to her approaching alliance with his patron, he reminded her of the readiness with which he had embraced her suggestions for the marriage of her daughter with Coningsby. Always obliging, she was never wearied of chanting his praises to her noble admirer, 
who was apparently much gratified she should have bestowed her esteem on one whom she would necessarily in after-life see so much. It is seldom the lot of husbands that their confidential friends gain the regards of their brides. "'I am glad you all like Rigby,' said Lord Monmouth, "'as you will see so much of him.' The remembrance of the Hellingsley failure seemed to be erased from the memory of the Marquis. Rigby never recollected him more cordial and confidential, and more equable in his manner. He told Rigby one day that he wished that Monmouth House should possess the most sumptuous and the most fanciful boudoir in London or Paris. What a hint for Rigby! That gentleman consulted the first artists, and gave them some hints in return. His researches on domestic decoration ranged through all ages. He even meditated a rapid tour to mature his inventions, but his confidence in his native taste and genius ultimately convinced him that this movement was unnecessary. The summer advanced, the death of the king occurred, the dissolution summoned Rigby to Coningsby and the borough of Darlford. His success was marked certain in the secret books of Tadpole and Taper. A manufacturing town, enfranchised under the Reform Act, already gained by the Conservative cause. Here was reaction, here influence of property, influence of character, too, for no one was so popular as Lord Monmouth, a most distinguished nobleman of strict Conservative principles, who, if he carried the county and the manufacturing borough also, merited the strawberry leaf. "'There will be no holding Rigby,' said Taper. "'I'm afraid he will be looking for something very high.' "'The higher the better,' rejoined Tadpole, "'and then he will not interfere with us. "'I like your high flyers. "'It is your plodders I detest, "'wearing old hats and high lows, "'speaking in committee, "'and thinking they are men of business, damn them.' "'Rigby went down and made some impressive speeches.' At least they read very well in some of his second-rate journals, where all the uproar figured as loud cheering, and the interruption of a cabbage stalk was represented as a question from some intelligent individual in the crowd. The fact is, Rigby bored his audience too much with history, especially with the French Revolution, which he fancied was his forte, so that people at last, whenever he made any allusion to the subject, were almost as terrified as if they had seen the guillotine. Rigby had as yet one great advantage. He had no opponent, and without personal opposition no contest can be very bitter. It was for some days Rigby versus liberal principles, and Rigby had much the best of it, for he abused liberal principles roundly in his harangues, who, not being represented on the occasion, made no reply while plenty of ale and some capital songs by Lucian Gay, who went down express, gave the right cue to the mob, who declared in chorus beneath the windows of Rigby's hotel that he was a fine old English gentleman. But there was to be a contest, no question about that, and a sharp one, although Rigby was to win and well. The Liberal Party had been so fastidious about their new candidate that they had none ready, though several biting. Jawster Sharp thought at one time that sheer necessity would give him another chance still. But even Rigby was preferable to Jawster Sharp, who, finding it would not do, published his long-prepared valedictory address, in which he told his constituents that, having long sacrificed his health to their interests, he was now obliged to retire into the bosom of his family and a very well-provided-for family, too. All this time the Liberal deputation from Darlford, two aldermen, three town councillors, and the secretary of the Reform Association, were walking about London like mad things, eating luncheons and looking for a candidate. They called at the Reform Club twenty times in the morning, badgered whips and red tapers, were introduced to candidates, badgered candidates, examined would-be members as if they were at a cattle show, listened to political pedigrees, dictated political pledges, referred to Hansard to see how men had voted, inquired whether men had spoken, finally discussed terms. But they never could hit the right man. If the principles were right, there was no money, and if money was ready, money would not take pledges. 
In fact, they wanted a phoenix, a very rich man, who would do exactly as they liked, with extremely low opinions and with very high connections. If he would go for the ballot and had a handle to his name, it would have the best effect, said the secretary of the Reform Association, because, you see, we are fighting against a right honourable, and you have no idea how much that takes with the mob. The deputation had been three days in town, and urged by dispatches by every train to bring affairs to a conclusion. Jaded, perplexed, confused, they were ready to fall into the hands of the first jobber or bold adventurer. They discussed over their dinner at a Strand coffee-house the claims of the various candidates who had presented themselves. Mr. Donald Macpherson Macfarlane, who would only pay the legal expenses, he was soon dispatched. Mr. Gingerly Brown of German Street, the younger son of a baronet, who would go as far as a thousand pounds, providing the seat was secured. Mr. Juggins, a distiller, two thousand pound man, but who would not agree to any annual subscriptions. Sir Baptist Placid, vague about expenditure, but repeatedly declaring that there could be no difficulty on that head. He, however, had a moral objection to subscribing to the races, and that was a great point at Darlford. Sir Baptist would subscribe a guinea per annum to the infirmary, and the same to all religious societies without any distinction of sects. But races, it was not the sum, a hundred pounds per annum, but the principal. He had a moral objection. In short, the deputation began to suspect what was the truth, that they were a day after the fair, and that all the electioneering rips that swarm in the purlieus of political clubs during an impending dissolution of Parliament, men who become political characters in their small circle because they have been talked of as once having had an intention to stand for places for which they never offered themselves, or for having stood for places where they never could by any circumstance have succeeded, were in fact nibbling at their dainty morsel. At this moment of despair a ray of hope was imparted to them by a confidential note from a secretary of the Treasury who wished to see them at the Reform Club on the morrow. You may be sure they were punctual to their appointment. The secretary received them with great consideration. He had got them a candidate, and one of high mark, the son of a peer, and connected with the highest Whig houses. Their eyes sparkled. A real honourable. If they liked, he would introduce them immediately to the Honourable Alberic de Cressy. He had only to introduce them, as there was no difficulty either as to means or opinions, expenses or pledges. The secretary returned with a young gentleman, whose diminutive stature would seem, from his smooth and singularly puerile countenance, to be merely the consequence of his very tender years. But Mr. de Cressy was really of age, or at least would be by nomination day. He did not say a word, but looked like the rosebud which dangled in the buttonhole of his frock coat. The aldermen and town councillors were what is sometimes emphatically styled flabbergasted. They were speechless from bewilderment. Mr. de Cressy will go for the ballot, said the Secretary of the Treasury, with an audacious eye and a demure look, and for total and immediate, if you press him hard, but don't, if you can help it, because he has an uncle, an old county member, who has prejudices and might disinherit him. However, we answer for him, and I am very happy that I have been the means of bringing about an arrangement which I feel will be mutually advantageous. And so saying, the secretary effected his escape. Circumstances, however, retarded for a season the political career of the Honourable Alberic de Crecy. While the Liberal Party at Darlford were suffering under the daily inflictions of Mr. Rigby's slashing style, and the Post brought them very unsatisfactory prospects of a champion, one offered himself, and in an address which intimated that he was no man of straw, likely to proceed from any contest in which he chose to embark. The town was suddenly placarded with a letter to the independent electors from Mr. Milbank, the new proprietor of Hellingsley. He expressed himself as one not anxious to obtrude himself on their attention, and founding no claim to their confidence on his recent acquisition, 
but at the same time as one resolved that the free and enlightened community with which he must necessarily hereafter be much connected should not become the nomination borough of any peer of the realm without a struggle if they chose to make one and so he offered himself if they could not find a better candidate without waiting for the ceremony of a requisition he was exactly the man they wanted and though he had no handle to his name and was somewhat impracticable about pledges his fortune was so great and his character so high that it might be hoped that the people would be almost as content as if they were appealed to by some obscure scion of factitious nobility subscribing to political engagements which he could not comprehend and which in general are vomited with as much facility as they are swallowed End of chapter three chapter four the people of darlford who as long as the contest for their representation remained between mr rigby and the abstraction called liberal principles appeared to be very indifferent about the result the moment they learned that for the phrase had been substituted a substance and that too in the form of a gentleman who was soon to figure as their resident neighbour became excited speedily enthusiastic all the bells of all the churches rang when mr milbank commenced his canvass the conservatives on the alert if not alarmed insisted on their champion also showing himself in all directions and in the course of four-and-twenty hours such is the contagion of popular feeling the town was divided into two parties the vast majority of which were firmly convinced that the country could only be saved by the return of mr rigby or preserved from inevitable destruction by the election of mr milbank the results of the two canvases were such as had been anticipated from the previous reports of the respective agents and supporters in these days the personal canvas of a candidate is a mere form the whole country that is to be invaded has been surveyed and mapped out before entry every position reconnoitred the chain of communications complete in the present case as was not unusual both candidates were really supported by numerous and reputable adherents and both had good grounds for believing that they would be ultimately successful but there was a body of the electors sufficiently numerous to turn the election who would not promise their votes conscientious men who felt the responsibility of the duty that the constitution had entrusted to their discharge and who would not make up their minds without duly weighing the respective merits of the two rivals this class of deeply meditative individuals are distinguished not only by their pensive turn of mind but by a charitable vein that seems to pervade their being not only will they think of your request but for their parts they wish both sides equally well decision indeed as it must dash the hopes of one of their solicitors seems infinitely painful to them they have always a good reason for postponing it if you seek their suffrage during the canvass they reply that the writ not having come down the day of election is not yet fixed if you call again to inform them that the writ has arrived they rejoin that perhaps after all there may not be a contest if you call a third time half dead with fatigue to give them friendly notice that both you and your rival have pledged yourselves to go to the poll, they twitch their trousers, rub their hands, and with a dull grin observe, Well, we shall see. Come, Mr. Jobson, says one of the committee, with an insinuating smile, give Mr. Milbank one. Jobson, I think you and I know each other, says a most influential supporter, with a knowing nod. Yes, Mr. Smith, I should think we did come come give us one well i have not made up my mind yet gentlemen jobson said the solemn voice didn't you tell me the other night you wished well to this gentleman so i do i wish well to everybody replies the imperturbable jobson well jobson exclaims another member of the committee with a sigh who could have supposed that you would have been an enemy i don't wish to be no enemy to no man mr tripp come jobson says a jolly tanner if i wanted to be a parliament man i don't think you could refuse me one i don't think i could mr oakfield well then give it to my friend 
"'Well, sir, I'll think about it.' "'Leave him to me,' says another member of the committee, with a significant look. "'I know how to get round him. It's all right.' "'Yes, leave him to Hayfield, Mr. Milbank. He knows how to manage him.' but all the same Jobson continues to look as little tractable and lamb-like as can well be fancied. And here, in a work which, in an unpretending shape, aspires to take neither an uninformed nor a partial view of the political history of the ten eventful years of the reform struggle, we should pause for a moment to observe the strangeness that only five years after the reconstruction of the electoral body by the Whig party, in a borough called into political existence by their policy, a manufacturing town too, the candidate comprising in his person every quality and circumstance which could recommend him to the constituency, and his opponent the worst specimen of the old generation, a political adventurer, who owed the least disreputable part of his notoriety to his opposition to the reform bill that in such a borough under such circumstances there should be a contest and that too one of a very doubtful issue what was the cause of this are we to seek it in the reaction of the tadpoles and the tapers that would not be a satisfactory solution reaction to a certain extent is the law of human existence in the particular state of affairs before us england after the reform act it could never be doubtful that time would gradually and in some instances rapidly counteract the national impulse of eighteen thirty two there never could have been a question for example that the english counties would have reverted to their natural allegiance to their proprietors but the results of the appeals to the third estate in eighteen thirty five and eighteen thirty seven are not to be accounted for by a mere adjustment of legitimate influences the truth is that considerable as are the abilities of the whig leaders highly accomplished as many of them unquestionably must be acknowledged in parliamentary debate experienced in council sedulous in office eminent as scholars powerful from their position the absence of individual influence and of the pervading authority of a commanding mind have been the cause of the fall of the whig party such a supremacy was generally acknowledged in lord grey on the accession of his party to power but it was the supremacy of a tradition rather than of a fact almost at the outset of his authority his successor was indicated when the crisis arrived the intended successor was not in the whig ranks it is in this virtual absence of a real and recognized leader almost from the moment that they passed their great measure that we must seek a chief cause of all that insubordination all those distempered ambitions and all those dark intrigues that finally broke up not only the whig government but the whig party demoralized their ranks and sent them to the country both in eighteen thirty five and eighteen thirty seven with every illusion which had operated so happily in their favour in eighteen thirty two scattered to the winds in all things we trace the irresistible influence of the individual and yet the interval that elapsed between eighteen thirty five and eighteen thirty seven proved that there was all this time in the whig array one entirely competent to the office of leading a great party though his capacity for that fulfilment was too tardily recognized lord john russell has that degree of imagination which though evinced rather in sentiment than expression still enables him to generalize from the details of his reading and experience and to take those comprehensive views which however easily depreciated by ordinary men in an age of routine are indispensable to a statesman in the conjunctures in which we live he understands therefore his position and he has the moral intrepidity which prompts him ever to dare that which his intellect assures him is politic he is consequently at the same time sagacious and bold in counsel as an administrator he is prompt and indefatigable he is not a natural orator and labours under physical deficiencies which even a demosthenic impulse could scarcely overcome but he is experienced in debate quick in reply fertile in resource 
takes large views and frequently compensates for a dry and hesitating manner by the expression of those noble truths that flash across the fancy and rise spontaneously to the lip of men of poetic temperament when addressing popular assemblies if we add to this a private life of dignified repute the accidents of his birth and rank which never can be severed from the man the scion of a great historic family and born as it were to the hereditary service of the state it is difficult to ascertain at what period or under what circumstances the whig party have ever possessed or could obtain a more efficient leader but we must return to the darlford election the class of thoughtful voters was sufficiently numerous in that borough to render the result of the contest doubtful to the last and on the eve of the day of nomination both parties were equally sanguine nomination day altogether is an unsatisfactory affair there is little to be done and that little mere form the tedious hours remain and no one can settle his mind to anything it is not a holiday for every one is serious it is not business for no one can attend to it it is not a contest for there is no canvassing nor an election for there is no poll it is the day of lounging without an object and luncheons without an appetite of hopes and fears confidence and dejection bravado bets and secret hedging and about midnight of furious suppers of grilled bones brandy and water and recklessness the president and vice-president of the conservative association the secretary and the four solicitors who were agents had impressed upon mr rigby that it was of the utmost importance and must produce a great moral effect if he obtained the show of hands with his powers of eloquence and their secret organization they flattered themselves it might be done with this view rigby inflicted a speech of more than two hours duration on the electors who bore it very kindly as the mob likes above all things that the ceremonies of nomination day should not be cut short moreover there is nothing that the mob likes so much as a speech rigby therefore had on the whole a far from unfavourable audience and he availed himself of their forbearance he brought in his crack theme the guillotine and dilated so elaborately upon its qualities that one of the gentlemen below could not refrain from exclaiming i wish you may get it this exclamation gave mr rigby what is called a great opening which like a practised speaker he immediately seized he denounced the sentiment as un-english and got much cheered excited by this success rigby began to call everything else un-english with which he did not agree until menacing murmurs began to rise when he shifted the subject and rose into a grand peroration in which he assured them that the eyes of the whole empire were on this particular election cries of that's true from all sides and that england expected every man to do his duty and who do you expect to do yours inquired a gentleman below about that air pension rigby screeched a hoarse voice don't you mind you govet them well rigby keep your spirits up old chap we will have you now said a stentorian voice and a man as tall as saul looked round him this was the engaged leader of the conservative mob the eye of every one of his minions was instantly on him now our young queen and our old institutions rigby for ever this was a signal for the instant appearance of the leader of the liberal mob magog wrath not so tall as bully bluck his rival had a voice almost as powerful a back much broader and a countenance far more forbidding now my boys the queen and millbank for ever these rival cries were the signals for a fight between the two bands of gladiators in the face of the hustings the body of the people little interfering bully bluck seized magog wrath's colours they wrestled they seized each other their supporters were engaged in mutual contest it appeared to be a most alarming and perilous fray several ladies from the windows screamed one fainted a band of special constables pushed their way through the mob you heard their staves resounded on the skulls of all who opposed them especially the little boys order was at length restored and to tell the truth the only hurts inflicted were those which came from the special constables 
Bully Bluck and Magog Wrath, with all their fierce looks, flaunting colours, loud cheers, and desperate assaults, were, after all, only a couple of condottieri, who were cautious never to wound each other. They were, in fact, a peaceful police, who kept the town in awe, and prevented others from being mischievous who were more inclined to do harm. Their hired gangs were the safety valves for all the scamps of the borough, who, receiving a few shillings per head for their nominal service, and as much drink as they liked after the contest, were bribed and organized into peace and sobriety on the days in which their excesses were most to be apprehended. Now Mr. Milbank came forward. He was brief compared to Mr. Rigby, but clear and terse. No one could misunderstand him. He did not favor his hearers with any history, but gave them his views about taxes, free trade, placemen, and pensioners, whoever and wherever they might be. Hello, Rigby, about that ere pension? Millbank for ever, we will have him. Never mind, Rigby, you'll come in next time. Mr. Millbank was energetic about resident representatives, but did not understand that a resident representative meant the nominee of a great lord who lived in a great castle. Great cheering. There was a lord once who declared that if he liked, he would return his negro valet to Parliament. But Mr. Millbank thought those days were over. It remained for the people of Darlford to determine whether he was mistaken. Never, exclaimed the mob, Millbank for ever, Rigby in the river, no niggers, no wallets. Three groans for Rigby. His language ain't as purty as the Lunnon chap, said a critic below, but he speaks from his art and give me the man who has got an art. That's your time of day, Mr. Robinson. Now, said Magog Wrath, looking round, now the Queen and Millbank for ever, hurrah! The show of hands was entirely in favour of Mr. Millbank. Scarcely a hand was held up for Mr. Rigby below, except by Bully Bluck and his Praetorians. The chairman and the deputy chairman of the Conservative Association, the secretary and the four agents, severally and respectively, went up to Mr. Rigby and congratulated him on the result, as it was a known fact that the show of hands never won. The eve of polling day was now at hand. This was the most critical period of an election. All night parties in disguise were perambulating the different wards, watching each other's tactics, masks, wigs, false noses, gentles in livery coats, men in female attire, a silent carnival of manoeuvre, vigilance, anxiety, and trepidation. The thoughtful voters about this time make up their minds. The enthusiasts who have told you twenty times a day for the last fortnight that they would get up in the middle of the night to serve you require the most watchful cooping. All the individuals who have assured you that their word is their bond change sides. Two of the Rigbyites met in the marketplace about an hour after midnight. Well, how goes it? said one. I have been the rounds, the blunts going like the ward pump. I saw a man come out of Moffat's house muffled up with a mask. I dodged him. It was Biggs. You don't mean that, do you? Dammy, I'll answer for Moffat. I never thought he was a true man. Told Robbins? I could not see him, but I met young Gunning and told him. Young Gunning, that won't do. I thought he was as right as the town clock. So did I, once. Hush, who comes here? The enemy, Franklin and Samson Potts keep close. I'll speak to them. Good night, Potts. Up rather late tonight? All fair election time. You ain't snoring, are you? Well, I hope the best man will win. I am sure he will. You must go from off at early to breakfast at the White Lion. That's your sort. Don't leave him. Unpole him yourself. I'm going off to Solomon Lacey's. He has got four Milbankites cooped up very drunk and I want to get them quietly into the country before daybreak. Tis polling day. The candidates are roused from their slumbers at an early hour by the music of their own bands perambulating the town, and each playing the conquering hero to sustain the courage of their jaded employers by depriving them of that rest which can alone tranquilize the nervous system. There is something in that matin burst of music followed by a shrill cheer from the boys of the borough, the only inhabitants yet up, that is very depressing. 
The committee rooms of each candidate are soon rife with black reports. Each side has received fearful bulletins of the preceding night campaign, and its consequences as exemplified in the morning, unprecedented tergiversations, mysterious absences, men who breakfast with one side and vote with the other, men who won't come to breakfast, men who won't leave breakfast. At ten o'clock, Mr. Rigby was in a majority of twenty-eight. The polling was brisk and equal until the middle of the day, when it became slack. Mr. Rigby kept the majority, but an inconsiderable one. Mr. Milbank's friends were not disheartened, as it was known that the leading members of Mr. Rigby's committee had polled, whereas his opponents were principally reserved. At a quarter past two there was a great cheering and uproar. The four voters in favour of Milbank, whom Solomon Lacey had cooped up, made drunk and carried into the country had recovered their senses made their escape and voted as they originally intended soon after this mr milbank was declared by his committee to be in a majority of one but the committee of mr rigby instantly posted a placard in large letters to announce that on the contrary their man was in a majority of nine if we could only have got another registration whispered the principal agent to mr rigby at a quarter past four you think it's all over then why i do not see now how we can win we have polled all our dead men and millbank is seven ahead i have no doubt we shall be able to have a good petition said the consoling chairman of the conservative association end of chapter four end of section twenty